this is Simon Humphreys and Peter Chen. They are going to be presenting academic partnerships and uh, intercultural negotiation, Lindell, um, from the study abroad SIG. Go ahead and give some opening remarks. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, so on behalf of the study abroad SIG, um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our forum this evening. My name is Lindell Nagashima and I'm the study abroad SIG coordinator and I'll be facilitating this evening. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce our experienced and knowledgeable presenters on the topic of academic leadership, uh, sorry, academic partnerships, intercultural negotiations. So Dr. Simon Humphreys teaches intercultural communication, including negotiation in the Faculty of Foreign Language Studies at Kansai University. He was involved in setting up his first partnership in 2004 at Kindai Technical College. He is now the Director of Study Abroad Partner Negotiations for his faculty, which has 19 partner universities. Our second presenter is Dr. Peter Chen, who is currently serving as Professor in the Department of Foreign Language, Languages and Applied Linguistics of National Taipei University in Taipei, Taiwan. Dr. Chen teaches international negotiation, intercultural communication, China, English Chinese translation and interpreting. Dr. Chen also serves as senior advisor at the Center for International Negotiations and Interpretations. In addition, besides, uh, sorry, in addition, Dr. Chen has been serving as international ambassador at the Office of International Affairs at National Taipei University since 2018 helping to establish academic partnerships with overseas universities, as well as joint research projects. So this forum is divided into four sections of 20 minutes each. Uh, so the first one is number one, setting up a partnership. Number two, negotiating different perspectives. Three, maintaining the partnership. And four, ending the partnership. Within each section, the presenters will talk for approximately five minutes each, followed by breakout rooms and main room discussions. Please use the chat for asking questions and giving comments, and I will relay these back to the presenters. Uh, lastly, we will have a few minutes at the end of the forum for SIG announcements. I'll now pass it over to Dr. Humphreys. Okay, thank you, uh, Lyndall, yeah, for the nice introduction there. Yeah, so just so everybody knows, uh, people have just joined, my colleague, uh, Professor Chen is through line. So um, I'll, he, he can't see what's happening. So I'll, I'll be like letting him know what slide we're on. And then also, if you can just let me know when he speaks, if you can actually, actually hear him. Uh, right, I'll just move on, Peter. Your, your slide is visible now, Peter. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, and thank you, uh, Lindo, uh, Chris. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it's really my honor to join this session, and uh, would like to share with you my, uh, I would say, my uh, professional knowledge and uh, my uh, experiences in establishing uh, academic, um, I would say, partnerships through intercultural negotiation. And uh, first of all, I would like to use my first uh, slide uh, called the first steps. Uh, I think I have five suggestions to you for those uh, viewers here. Uh, I would suggest that we can make the first contact by referring to the first one is professional international education agencies such as CIEE the Council on International Educational Exchange, which I think is based on Washington, D.C. in the United States, and the U.S. Fulbright Program. It's a very big program for uh, international scholars and uh, uh, students exchange. Uh, number two is international university and colleges as recommended by the overseas representative offices, like embassies and or consulates, for example, of Japan's Ministry of Education, Ministry of Cultural Affairs and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In Taiwan, we do have uh, university and college recommended by our overseas uh, representative offices. And number three, my suggestion for the first step contact will be through international university or colleges that we seek to establish overseas academic 
uh, partnerships actively. That means we make our proposals and or that seek to step to oversee that partnership with us actively. That means they come to, uh, they propose themselves to us. And number four is the project bound and the issue centered, for example, dealing with the COVID-19 international university college with the potential conclusion uh, of ac academic agreements in terms of Trinity, which means the teaching, research, and the service. If we are dealing with the COVID-19 and what other probably joint uh, research projects to deal with academic uh, partnerships. And the last suggestion, a last suggestion I would make to build up the first contact will be uh, the alma mater of Professor Chinchins at your own university college. For example, if, if your your professor graduated from Harvard, uh, if uh, uh, from Yale, or from uh, from a different university in the world, uh, probably the professors or students at your university uh, they can serve as a uh, uh, as a mediator to refer to those universal or uh, college they graduate from. Those are my five uh, suggestions to make first steps. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Peter, I've moved on to my slide now. Um, so, uh, yeah, as, as, um, as Lyndall mentioned, uh, I, I started uh, my first experience of international uh, liaisons was back in uh, 2004. Um, I was at uh, Kindai, Kindai Kosen. Um, so that's a kind of, um, it's a very, very rural kind of uh, technical college. I think uh, Americans would call it a, a junior college, an engineering college. And um, so th this was, this was um, set up um, uh, we set up like like uh, Peter was mentioning before about uh, you know like to do the you can set these part first partnerships up through contacts. I was kind of like um, in a way like taking advantage in a way or that doesn't sound a very nice way of saying it, but making the most I should say the fact that my father was teaching engineering at um, a college in England, and, uh. and we we had a we had a budget. For um, for uh, for um, uh, a festival for a school festival, and using that budget, we use that to kind of put forward our 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 thing, you know, to create the the international link. But that was a very kind of like small thing in the countryside, and uh, we were um, it was more like short cultural visits, and that that kind of set me on my way, it got me interested in that kind of thing. But now I'm at Kansai University. I've been there since 2014. It's a much bigger kind of program. Um, I think one of the reasons why they hired me was because they knew that I'd had a bit of a background in international liaisons before, but it certainly wasn't uh, any preparation for the Kansai University one, which we now have uh, 19 partner universities um, across America, Canada, uh, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, France, Korea, Taiwan, Kyrgyzstan, and China. Um, and I, I've been set involved in setting up um, eight of those partnerships. Um, so the, the big question is when we're setting these up, I think what you would like to hear is like, how do we, um, how do we choose how do we choose these partners? Um, at Kansai University, um, our faculty, Faculty of Foreign Language Studies, we, we don't do it through um, like necessarily picking, say, the most prestigious universities. Uh, we tend to choose partners that we think uh, will be very welcoming to our students or universities where there are very few Japanese. And um, we, we run a coordinated program because um, all of our students must study overseas in their second year and uh, they need to uh, graduate in four years. So because it's kind of compulsory, um, we really look after the students quite a lot. And uh, we, we kind of, we, we 
choose partner universities that agree uh, that they will offer a coordinator who will help our students to choose their courses, do arrival orientations, facilitate accommodation, and contact us whenever there are any problems. So there's a quite a lot of handholding in a way, which is very, very different to many other study abroad or exchange programs, which are done more independently. Um, when we're starting these things off, we, uh, um, of course, we start through email and things like that. But um, after a bit, you know, we, we also use Zoom and we always go and visit the universities to make sure to check the quality and meet the people from the various departments to look after our students. Um, the, uh, the Japanese norms point that I've added on the third point on the slide, uh, that, that's from a funny comment. I remember Rod Ellis saying to me, he said, uh, what we're doing is we're imposing Japanese norms on our partner universities. Um, yeah, it's, it does sound a bit that way, but um, we just kind of want our partners to um, accept our kind of coordinated way of of, um, of uh, offering the, the partnership. So it's, it's quite uh, tightly controlled in that way. OK, um, next. Um, we, we've talked a bit now. I think it's good for you to have some um, it's going to breakout rooms. Simon, would you like to hand it over to um, some Yvonne. people that spoke in the sessions and would like to share, perhaps? Exactly, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So any comments or, or questions or anything from your, from your sessions? Anyone want to share anything you talked about? Any of your yeah, similar experiences to what we mentioned or anything like that you want to share? Uh, Simon, uh, could I interrupt a little bit? Yeah. I just want to say another way to uh, probably to uh, make the first steps will be, for example, it can be uh, our major programs will be first priority. By that, I mean, for example, our university uh, was transformed from a college of law and commerce. In other words, our programs uh, were famous for laws and the uh, laws in the business. Therefore, our first steps to make outside contact will be looking for not those, as Simon said, not those prestigious universities, but those probably uh, which have the similar. Uh, produce programs in law and uh, business. That, that's what I'm trying, trying to, to make suggestion. Find those, we have the general commonalities, the same disciplines, while still maybe we can reserve the differences, but we can look the common ground. That's what I'm trying to add a little bit here. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Uh, Stephen's added a comment. Um, so you talked about online projects with a distant partner and the best way to make initial connections. Yeah, would you like to tell us more about that, Stephen? Yeah. yeah. Well, it is what it says. We had two main topics of discussion. One of them, uh, one of the teachers in the room asked about um, in this time of COVID, how we can encourage online partnerships and discussions uh -huh. between students. And uh, another teacher was asking about, well, when you make initial contacts with potential partner schools, how are those best made? Is it through a personal introduction and so on? Right. Yeah, so Peter was saying you, a, lot, a lot of the time through personal introductions. And um, yeah, I, we... At our place, that's definitely the way we started. I think that's very much the Japanese way, in a way, like through personal contacts. When when I first arrived, we we had it, these partner universities like in Kansas and Utah and so on that maybe um, students might not think of going to normally, but we, we had those partnerships and we still have them. They're good, actually, but it's because that our professors had been there. And then, um, yeah, so I think a lot of the time it has been through that. Mm -hmm. But um, more of the recent ones um, we've we've um, 
had like a checklist of criteria that we've looked at and we've used that. Um, and you mentioned about COVID-19. Um, because of the way, I mean, America, Europe has just been pretty scary with the, the cases rising so fast. We, we realized that um, next semester we're going to have to have uh, online with all of our partners in reality and then hope that they'll be able to go overseas from the summer onwards or, or in, in fall onwards. We're hoping, but we don't know. That's it. That's been optimistic. That's our optimist. But at, at the bare minimum, we we set up something online for them for next semester. And because um, Oceania, they're not as badly hit as elsewhere, and their time difference is closer to ours, uh, we 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 set up two partnerships really quickly um, with uh, one in New Zealand and one in Australia, and uh, that was a little bit more through. Um, one we are at an MOU on a kind of a university level mm -hmm. and another one our agent mm -hmm. knew the university quite well because we had to move fast for these two Oceanian ones. Uh, but of course, I mean, we, we still can't really play. I mean, now Japan is going up like that, isn't it? With COVID-19. The Australians and the Kiwis, I don't think they want anyone from Japan going there. So it's like the opposite way around. But we, we just do what we can. We just do the best we can, really. Yeah. OK, but so that, I'm move on to the next one. Just we're hitting 22 minutes now. So shall we move on to the next section? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I'll, set, I'll screen share again, uh, Peter, your slide. Okay, Peter, yeah. Peter, you might be on, on mute. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. Simon, can I start talking about this different perspectives? Yes, please. I, I think, uh, can everybody see uh, my slide, Peter's slide, negotiating different perspectives? Can you all see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> it's a little bit wordy here. I just uh, present my uh, some of my ideas and based on some of the, uh, I would say, some of my textbook uh, points, which are personal findings here. But I would like to share with you very quickly. Uh, it's about uh, how do we negotiate different perspectives here, and then the first one is that when we put the so-called before the negotiation, identify in advance what the different perspectives are before negotiating, establishing the academic partners in terms of, I, I would like to share with you some seven, uh, seven elements very quickly. Uh, the first one's interest, but unlike those in the business negotiation, here interest means the academic interests, you know, based on the uh, similar I would say just like we say common ground in the disciplines, different disciplines, different fields. And options means that can we be prepared first by uh, probably make some proposals by using like if then structure, uh, make this kind of proposals, try and find the best possible options uh, to me as many as possible. In other words, more options uh, probably better uh, outcome for our uh, building up the uh, academic partnerships. And alternatives, I mean, before we try to build up this uh, perspect uh, different perspective uh, possible academic partnership, always think about what else we might do. In other words, uh, our targeted universal or universe, universal college, which we can put even more before those targeted university colleges. And uh, number four, the legitimacy, I mean the objective criteria. Uh, that means we want to treat each other fairly. By legitimacy, I mean, maybe we can talk about the criteria in terms of, for example, the uh, what will be the, uh, the laws or regulations behind our uh, potential 
uh, I would say, uh, cooperation, collaborations. And that's the, that's the first one, the relevant laws or regulations. And number two can based on the precedents or previous examples, uh, which we can refer to. Uh, what I'm saying is by looking for those older documents, okay? And the third one is what we call is the market price. When we say market price, it doesn't mean that the business market price is that what will be the better or legitimate way to treat each other that we find this price potential mark is fair. And number four is if we can look for some inter, I would say the intervention of the third party, if we cannot really negotiate with each other by building up the academic partnership, we can looking for mediators or even arbitrators or even process consultants to do this. Okay, that's what I'm calling legitimacy preparation. We can prepare those five objective criteria, or sometimes we say the five external standards. By communication, the fifth one I mean, how do we communicate each other by saying that the uh, one-way communication or two-way communication, or now in our view, we say the uh, third, not the third conversation, but the transactional, com uh, transactional communication, which means we always begin by listening to other parties' interests and positions. And then the sixth one, the relation actually from the Chinese guanxi, okay? Guanxi is kind of relationship means that we use by saying that intercultural speaking, guanxi is more important than the rational or reasoning process. Guanxi is based on how much friendship we have, we have had, okay? The guanxi means uh, we can use this guanxi even before we start the negotiation of building up the academic partnership. And the last one, commitment, we must be prepared in terms of what kind of specific commitment and the realistic commitment we can make. By specific, that means we don't make a vague or we don't make the, I would say the general commitment. We make something very solid or come, for example, our memorandum of understanding or our, uh, our in a sense that our agreement will be saying that five years with certain kind of visitors, uh, fellowship or scholarship, I call that specific. And realistic, I mean, when we make community realistic, that means we try to make the uh, commitment possible, available. So I say these two words, being specific and being realistic. And the, the second point I said, recognize the influence of culture on negotiation in managerial perspectives during the process and outcome of negotiation between our host university and partner university. In principle, what I'm trying to say here, there are 10 different ways that culture can influence negotiation overseas academic partnership. These 10, uh, these 10 ways, uh, I adopt from uh, Lewicki, Saunders, and Barry textbook. So the credits goes to them, uh, not mine, but the findings are mine, okay? So I would like to share with you the first one is the uh, definition of negotiation. Because sometimes the, the negotiation for some culture, the definition of negotiation means something negotiable, but sometimes the so other negotiation, some other culture think that this topic is non-negotiable. So we have to decide which is negotiable and which is not negotiable. And negotiation opportunity, that means we try to look for the maximized opportunity to talk about rather than the minimum. Usually it's a choice between interest and the positions. We have to maximize the opportunity. And the third selection of negotiators, I mean, when we select the negotiators, we try to find out in our culture, maybe those senior negotiators will have more power, maybe more persuasive, but some other culture, it not depends upon the age. The, the negotiator will be based on, the selection will be based on credibility or experience, et cetera. Protocol means something like we saw the like international uh, international uh, etiquette, okay? It's a, 
is the way of being polite. And then communication here means deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning, uh, communication sense. And time sensitivity, I mean, when we negotiate, are we treating time as an event or are we trying to look at time as a clock time? By event time, I mean, let's deal with this uh, academic partnership case by finishing this case. We don't have to worry about the time. If it takes years, okay. But sometimes another culture, maybe like American or some European country culture, time means money. Time means the clock time. You owe me five minutes, okay. That kind of sign intensivity. And then the seven risk propensity means after we deal with, or I mean during or after we talk about the uh, negotiation of academic partnership, are we running any kind of risk? Are we losing? our credibility or profits, anything like that. So we call that risk propensity. We have to analyze that a little bit. And then number eight, groups versus individuals. I think groups belong to the, I think belong to Asian culture, group power rather than individual power. And then nature agreements, that means depends upon how long or how bad, or even I would say nature agreements deals with what kind of joint, joint projects we need to deal with, okay? And the last one, emotionalism. To me, the emotionalism for my culture is just like relationship uh, in, the, in, the sixth, uh, in the sixth item above. Emotionalism has two powers. One power is the, solid, the solidation, the foundation for guanxi, for connection. But emotionalism is another negative thing will be against, will be a hinder, will be an impairment for rational reasoning. So we must take into consideration. And the last point I want to deal with the different perspective, I mean, realize the negotiation rhetoric. That means in the West, in the Western society, in the Greek philosophy, for example, Rhetoric is the art of persuasion, but in Chinese culture, rhetoric means say something more polishing, <laughs> more beautiful, not necessarily rationally uh, persuasive, but just maybe more say something nice. I mean, maybe not something persuasive, but something nice. And negotiation translation written in interesting oral from second language into third language into English. By, by this, I mean, when we negotiate with different languages, we must know sometimes we can use translators or interpreters. We don't have to worry about our using the language because it seems to me in the 19th century, French may be the, the most dominating, almost dominating uh, language in negotiation. But nowadays it seems to me, if we can use our mother tongue to negotiate and rely on the negotiation interpreter, it probably will be better because I think we can use our mother tongue more thoroughly, okay, and more more clearly. And the and the last one will be in intercultural negotiation table when we establishing quality academic partnerships. Language is still the primordial, or language is still something we can rely on. But to me, of course. I hope I can speak more Japanese, okay? <laughs> but my second language, my foreign language is uh, French, but my mother tongue is Mandarin Chinese. And, but English is, we have to use as, uh, as I said, objective and standard communication tool. I'm, I'm sorry for being talkative. That, that's what I'm trying to say here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think um, we 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 might be running slightly over time. So over the breakout rooms thing, I think we'll we'll go through our sections, Peter, and then we'll have okay. a larger Sorry breakout room at the end to make sure we don't go go over time. All right. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So over negotiating different perspectives. Yeah. Um, the first thing you can see, my first bullet point is about the dual language English standard. Our dual language program in our faculty is something that's quite uh, unusual. I think it's unique. I, I don't know of any other, I've asked around, I don't know of any other Japanese universities that offer this. 
And what it is, is um, our English majors can study English and their minor language, and it's a very minor language. They only do about, uh, about uh, two classes, I think it is, or one, no, one, one or two classes a week for 30 weeks before doing their study abroad. But they, they, they go and study English and their minor language uh -huh. in the country of their minor language. So they go to um, France or Germany, Kyrgyzstan, South Korea or Taiwan. They're our dual language countries. And um, our partners sometimes misunderstand about how high we require the English content to be. They, they often think uh, that uh, the, the, the local language is more important and we have to stress to them that um, they're English majors and they need to do kind of a 60% English to 40% local language balance mm -hmm. because when they return to their um, return to Japan after their study abroad, they, they've got to compete with students who've um, been to uh, target English countries like America or England. And so it, it's quite important. And one time I, I nearly got in trouble actually, Peter, with our Taiwanese partner because um, mm. I, I had to let them know that the TOEFL scores were much lower than elsewhere. And I kind of <laughs> caused offense. I think they lost face a little bit and I had to be very, very careful over that, over what I said and explain, well, they're having a very enriching experience through doing Chinese too. Uh, but um, we, can we find ways to try and boost their, their English a bit? So that's the first one. Uh, another different perspective is the kind of cultural academic thing. A lot of our partner universities uh, tend to think it's going to be like my first experience I told everyone about in 2004, where it's more cultural and for experience uh, or student growth and independence. A lot of partners think it's going to be that way. And, and that is important, uh, but we really need uh, to always stress the academic side. That's really important that we want our students to improve academically at their English and their English content study. And um, in a way, although student growth and independence is important, we ask our partners to really look after the students and we have to explain to them that um, they might not be quite as mature as some of the other um, st uh, international students that are, are studying at their, their, their uh, universities. Um, and the, the, the kind of coordination that we have, another thing that might be a bit unusual is that because of the academic year, they're going in maybe around April time with the Japanese academic year, with the um, places like America and England and so on, that they don't start the academic year until the autumn, the fall. So um, it begins with like language centers and we want them to progress through and uh, then go on to the undergraduate courses. But we don't want any special treatment. We don't want them to just pass our students. We have to stress it's okay to fail them. They won't complain for that. Just make sure it's rigorous. Um, one British university, our students were very disappointed because they felt that they could do better presentations than the, the local British students. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we had to uh, negotiate to encourage them to give uh, the same kind of assessment as, yeah. as the local students. It's all about basically making clear what the expectations are at the very beginning. And I think this needs to be made all the way around. I think uh, we need to make our expectations clear to the partner universities. But also at the same, same time, um, have to make it clear to the students what to expect so they don't get disappointed with certain things. Mm -hmm. And on the university side as well. So that's the last one. I sometimes feel I have to act like a bridge. Um, then sometimes the, the university um, feels that changes can't be made because our own university might not change as flexibly as overseas universities. But other times 
there are demands that are made and I have to try and balance it out a bit. I have to try and understand the, the foreign partner universities and our side, the Kansai side as well. Um, so I have to try and advise both sides. But because um, our officers might just be looking at their one area, like transcripts or something like that. And, oh. and I have to persuade beyond that. But at the same time, I have to avoid going native. Um, I'm not going to support either side. I'm not going to totally support the partner universities either. Um, and at the end of the day, it's the students that are the most important. That's what I always think. So I'm always, with all the negotiations, I'm always trying to make the best program possible for the students. Mm. Okay, so we're going to just skip the, this breakout room here and we'll move on to maintaining the partnership. So back to Peter. Peter, okay. just a reminder, if you could keep your session to five minutes, we're really running out of time here now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Peter. Okay, All right. Peter. Yeah, your yeah. five minutes, yeah. All right, then how do we maintain uh, the partnership? Uh, I make some two points here. The first one is, uh, following the conclusion of academic agreements, such as agreement on exchange and or a memorandum of understanding on academic exchange between our host university and the partner university, we can maintain uh, the partnership by reinforcing the constant, the first one, student exchange, faculty research exchange, and the validity of the renewal of agreement based upon uh, the principle of academic equity and the reciprocity. Here, I mean, for example, we're offering solid scholarship, fellowship, and research grants, substantial academic collaboration, and the facilitation of academic process, physical relocation, and cultural orientation of all exchange students, fact researchers. Uh, here, I would like to add what Simon just said. I think the clear goals of expectations will be very important as the international ambassador Sometimes we cannot make our expectations clearly, and sometimes we cannot make our, uh, I would say, reciprocity at equal status. The equal status, I mean, sometimes it's not academics. I agree with Simon, sometimes it's a face issue. It's a, sometimes we feel that if the university is not that prestigious, they will say they are, they feel dwarfed, okay? <laughs> they feel dwarfed in their dignity. But sometimes if we face a more prestigious university, then we feel slightly dwarfed, okay? <laughs> so in this kind of sense, I would, the real, the real equity and uh, I would say um, reciprocity is not just academic, but sometimes it's a cultural stuff too. It's a cultural issue. Issue-centered lectures, symposiums, forums, workshops, conference in both academic and cultural values should be held and sponsored frequently. I, I, I was at Cornell University four years ago uh, as, a, as a, a Fulbright, US Fulbright uh, visiting scholar. It seems to me every week or every two weeks, they will have like a informal, uh, I would say workshop forums, which I think is very helpful to maintain, not necessarily the academic quality, but the relationship in dealing with the how we collaborate in a sense of looking for the better professional improvement. In other words, we treat each other as co-broker of culture, if I have such term, co-broker, but a co-cultural broker, okay. But I just want to say, it will be better to know that we are dealing with the academic partnerships. We're not dealing with the business uh, business or profitable uh, interest-bound uh, relationship. And the second point will be in general, the Dean and his or her college of international affairs, OIA, I think every university probably has, every has this kind of office or the relevant international intercultural agencies of our host university in partnership play the key roles of maintaining the, and maximize 
maximizing the academic interest while minimizing intercultural conflicts derived from maybe from cultural chauvinism, ideological indifferences, foreign government control and bureaucracy. For example, in Taiwan, we have a centralized educational system. We have to follow the Ministry of Education's order, okay, in a sense. And then failing to reach the effect conflict management, mutual adjustment assimilation through respect and the ultimate goal of academic interdependence. By interdependence, I mean still goes back to the reciprocity. It's not necessarily so-called dependent on the prestige. It's not so-called independence of our so-called our, our own university or college's uh, uh, prestige. What I'm trying to say is maybe we can use interdependence mindset to make the academic partnerships expansion of the pie rather than the independence or dependence uh, contrast in terms of the, uh, I would say the conflict management. That's what I'm going to say, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Peter. Yeah, I think um, it's it's a very important point what you what you said there about the um, it's it's not like a business um, kind of agreement, is it? It's not like a business relationship. It it's um, it's an academic one, and yeah, we're we're trying to like you say like expand the pie, like make the pie bigger, mm. uh, grow value for both sides rather than cut the pie up. Uh, and you know, d dividing up between us, like grabbing as big a piece of pie for ourselves, kind of thing. Yeah, so I agree. We 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 um we, but there's also the times where we, we yeah we do we do have some conflicts and so on or some like awkward moments and yeah it it it's it can be hard. Uh, we we have to try and keep a balance. Uh, so the the screen that I'm showing here, the slide here, yeah, we we have to try and be assertive without getting aggressive. Um, I think usually we can find agreement uh, because we're we're focusing on on the students, on doing what's right for the students. And when we always remember that, um, that that usually gets us to some kind of agreement. Um, on, on, the, on the idea of like sharing information and expanding the pie, like creating more value for both sides. Yeah, we, we, we don't really hide too much information. Of course, there's, there's always some things in a negotiation, you're not going to give everything away, um, but we, we are quite open about sharing published information with our partners and uh, letting them know what the other partners are doing. And, um, and it helps them to like uh, know what standards we have, what standards they need to reach to be similar to the other partners. And it also encourages them to maybe compete a little bit and differentiate, position themselves differently to the, mm -hmm. to the other partners so that they can attract our, our students. Um, when, we, when we have um, like difficulties, uh, so, it's better to deal through more than one person in some ways. Our faculty, actually, I think it's a kind of a Japanese thing. We like to have somebody we can trust. I think the Japanese style of negotiation is very, very trust-based. I mm -hmm. think Taiwan is similar, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, but um, at the same time, um, despite that desire for like one coordinator we can trust, for like visas and accommodation and so on. It is good that we have as many contacts as possible at the partner universities. So that if, if we have a problem with one of our contacts, not replying to emails or, or whatever, or they might, you, you never know, people are humans, they, they have problems and so on. Uh, it's good to have somebody else we can contact to try and uh, solve problems. And, and we do this quite a lot if we can't, through one person, just this week, I, I've had to do this. Yeah. Um, phone versus email, um, the, the third point. I think email is fantastic for recording what we've agreed, keeping records of stuff. I have a terrible memory and 
I, I have to go back through the, the records of, of meetings, the, the emails of recording what we've kept. But um, when we have a problem and things aren't moving, then sometimes there's no option but to pick up the phone. And uh, that can be the best way to overcome these kind of intercultural differences. It can make it much easier if you speak to someone on the phone, less likely to maybe misinterpret an, an email. But on the other hand as well, we, we do work hard to build up strong bonds. Uh, we encourage our partner universities to come over every, every spring when it's non-COVID time. And uh, they promote their programs to our students. And we, we have lunch with them. Uh, we, we buy them lunch, we give them omiyage, and, and then we, we talk about, we talk through things. And we, we, tr we every time they visit, we try and uh, improve the relationship and improve things for the for the students. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're getting back on time now, Lyndall. Um, what do you think? Can we have a breakout room, Lyndall? Um, well, I think the, the final section is shorter as well. Can we do a breakout room about re maintaining relationships? And okay, so uh, three minutes. Yeah. Three minutes. Yeah, I'll just change the next slide first. So, um, yeah, uh, so in your breakout rooms, maybe if you're involved in study abroad, please share examples of times when you face challenges maintaining partnerships with your overseas schools. And of course, like before, any questions you'd like to ask us, maybe you can think of those as well in your breakout rooms. Okay, so. Okay, I'm gonna open yeah some breakout rooms for three minutes, opening now. And uh, the, is that working okay? Can you see the slides? Yeah. Okay. Yep, they should be able to see it. Thank you. Right, ending the partnership. Okay, Peter, your five minutes. Uh, Peter, you might be on mute. The, uh, I would say uh, maybe the expectations from students from Taiwan might have different kinds of motivations. They want to try to put the, uh, I would say, getting the degree as the first priority. In other words, when we talk about international uh, uh, partnerships or or from the intercultural negotiation, uh, our I think our students uh, compare with uh, international students, uh, especially from I would say American, uh, especially from America, from United Kingdom, etc., from Ireland, just as Amy said. I, I think when I met different students, they have different kind of goals. Some of they really treat this as an interchange program. But for our students, when we, when we go outside, when we go to other countries, uh, I think probably we all need to maintain how competitive we are to get the degree as the first priority. And then if we come back to the partnership, uh, when do we end or how possibly we end this partnership? Uh, I, I just have four, four observations here. The first one's, when the validity of the signed of agreement terminate, then that's terminates. Okay, the academic partnership expires. That's the that's the legal part. And the second one is when both our host universities and partnership university find, or either one finds, that the ongoing academic academic partnerships have fallen into a dispute bargaining, which means it's based on based on I would say zero sum game. One party wins, the other party loses. The based on competition happens rather than an integrity negotiation in which a win-win outcome cooperation happens, the academic partnership which should end. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is, are we trying to end the partnership because of the academic interest or are we trying to end the partnership because of the benefits? Uh, in terms of, for example, some of them say, uh, I have to be frank, some of my, uh, my, my boss, the president, sometimes different president here, 
they will say, Peter, we need tuition fee too, okay? <laughs> in other words, sometimes we have a conflict between the academic interest and the business interest, just as uh, Simon just mentioned. All right, and then the third point I would like to say is, when the academic collaborations between our host university and the Polish university have become less and less productive, and even when they have become obviously dormant, I mean, the, I mean, we both side lose energy about uh, building up this kind of relationship or sleeping, okay, in a sense. There are no reasons to continue the academic partnerships. But my experience, uh, my experience have told me usually the reason why we start, we end because we can no longer find the better or more creative, more constructive options for building up a, I would say, a partnership that will probably stimulate both parties to move forward. It just, I want to say, this is something happens too. And the last point will be uh, when the academic collaboration between our, between our host university and partners universities have, have tended to fail to invent options for mutual gain. Here, I still want to say the mutual gain of academic interest in academics and cultural values. In other words, sometimes we find maybe what different kind of approaches to cultural values and have ignored the reviewing the theory, the dual concern model. I want to take advantage of this dual concern model, which deals with both interest and relationship. That means, are we talking about interest between our two parties? Are we talking about the relationship uh, establishment? And then that will lead to adopting the negotiation strategy and the contending, five of them. When we talk contending, that means our own interests dominate, avoiding that neither neither parties will care about the interest relationship. And the yielding means that we only care about the other party's interest, the other party dominate, but not care about our interest. Problem solving that both parties resolve the conflict to enhance interest and relationships. And uh, compromising is both parties yield to maintain mutual interest in relation. It is wise to end the academic at an intercultural negotiation table when we exactly know about the dual concern model. However, my findings are, if we have this kind of dual concern model, we have to decide what do we really mean by interest? What do you really mean by uh, so-called the, uh, the relationships? It seems to me uh, at National Taipei University, we have now more than around like 200 universities and colleges around the world. But seems to me, frankly speaking, not that active, not that energetic. And sometimes we, we just want to keep a, keep a, how to say, a quantitative statistics record. But to me, there are no real qualitative uh, establishment among the, I would say, the relation according to the agreement or the, uh, uh, MOU there. Therefore, when we talk about collaborations, I mean, when we talk about interests or relationships, I think we must know what we really want to get, to gain, or what do we mean by mutual gain from the two universities and the partnership uh, is established or being established. Actually, we're going to have another meeting uh, only recently to about, we have to discuss about, about our relation with the 200 universities and, and colleges there. Are we- Sorry to interrupt you there, Peter. We're just hitting seven minutes now. So is it okay to hand it over to Simon? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I will stop here, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say, we're in in our case, um, yeah, it, it's quite good what Peter introduced uh, just now about like the the interests and like uh, when 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 partners get 
more absorbed in their own interests, that's when problems can happen. I, I think uh, in general, um, we might be quite demanding on our partners. We, we do kind of drive quite a hard bargain and I do know that. And, and I do sometimes feel it a bit for the partners, I, I have to admit, but at the end of the day, I know I'm, I'm focusing on the students. But the, there are two cases that we had. Um, I, I would say, yeah, we're reaching a point now where we've got so many partners where things are getting thinned out and we might have some partners just fizzling out. But there are two partnerships that we needed to end. There was a British case and a Filipino case. Um, and both of these, really, it was due to the coordinator. So it really was like, a, in Peter's example of um, self-interest was taking over with these coordinators. Um, in the British case, um, yeah, it was quite a, it, it was a highly ranked, it, it is a highly ranked university. So again, it's like Peter was saying about the, the face and the, and the ranking level kind of thing. I think they, they probably felt that they were uh, better than us or the coordinator certainly did. So there was a little bit of snobbery there, I guess. And the, the contact who worked with this coordinator before me really struggled dealing with her and passed on all this information to me. But I, I really tried to make it work, but she kind of treats it like her fiefdom in a way. She'd been there for a long time. And I found out that the other people in the same university in the UK, they were struggling to deal with her as well. And uh, I tried to, I, I went to the university as well. I traveled over there to try and fix the problem and uh, tried to set up with a, an alternative coordinator as well. But um, she wouldn't let go and just kept continuing to attack. And in the end, what we did was we just had to advise our students that um, this part in the university wasn't providing the coordination that the other partners were doing. That there, was, there were certain fundamental things that weren't being offered there. And then the students made their own decisions not to go. And uh, in, that, in the case of this one, the partnership just ended naturally. We just let the MOU uh, run its course and just ended quietly. The Filipino case was a little bit more, uh, how can I say? Um, this was dealing more with legality because uh, the coordinator was taking money from our students. Uh, and she kind of mentioned that, you know, like it's almost like a Japanese, I've forgotten the exact words, but she felt the Japanese students had um, an obligation in a way to give money to local people, to give money to people there. That was her belief. I'm not saying other people from there had the same belief as her, but that's the way she felt. And she was charging them extra fees, extra secret fees that we didn't know about. And I don't think her university knew about. In other words, she thought that our students were rich and she was treating them like ATM machines. And um, this is completely wrong because to be fair, I mean, the students who chose the Philippines chose it because it was a cheaper option than um, some of the other part, most of the other part, well, nearly all the other part in the universities. And they weren't necessarily wealthy students. But anyway, it's just plain wrong. She should not be taking money off our students like that. We reported it to the president. We went over there. We tried to solve it. There was no progress. Mm. Uh, they didn't report back to us. They didn't investigate it properly. So we sent an official letter from our dean and terminated the agreement. We did it in a polite way, but we, we made it clear that we couldn't continue with that partnership. OK. Um, Right. Uh, I think the final breakout room, uh, you can, what am I doing? Sorry. So for the final breakout room, uh, I think three minutes again, is that okay, Lyndall? People are talking about examples where they've 
they've sh maybe struggled and they've thought about ending partnerships, what to do or what they did, and then any questions that they might want to ask us afterwards. And I think for the final part, we might have a bit of time to cover anything like an open floor, won't we, Linda? I think. And so right. if we do three minutes breakout, come back, report, any extra questions or comments would be perfect, and then we'll wrap. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Three minute breakout rooms opening now. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, um, maybe the, there are people who've not had the chance to to speak much. Um, like in the breakout room, as I said just now, Robert, uh, you're in the middle of, of talking about something. Uh, uh, Robert Aspinall or anybody else, if you want to take this opportunity to to share your experiences on, on any of the things we've covered, you know, like, uh, please, please share. No, I was just saying, is it OK to talk? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, sure. Um, yes. The problem we had when I was at Shiga, we had a relationship with Michigan, is that um, we were teaching students um, uh, in the university at, at Shiga who were in the Japan Center for Michigan University. So there, there were lots of those students and they weren't paying. Um, so we got all these credits that our students could use over there in Michigan, but they had requirements for English level that our students couldn't match. Uh, so we always had too many of there was a deficit in the number of credits but in the end neither side really minded because it was also a sister state shiga prefecture and michigan state as a sister states uh, so it was, it was more important than just the numbers just just the actual balance of, of students going back and forth and so neither side really minded but it was a bit lopsided that, that was the point i was making Thank you, yeah. Um, people can use the chat as well if they want to, if they feel a bit worried about jumping in. Please don't hold back. I think we've got about four minutes. Is that right, Lyndall? And then you want to do like final comments like to do the essays? That's right. Yeah, and we do have a comment from Edo-san. Um, if Edo-san would like to pitch in and maybe just expand on the comment that you added to chat. If not, that's fine too. Oh, he's muted. Oh, okay. So I'll just read what um, Edo-san has said. He's not sure about others, but I've seen a dramatic decline in support we're seeing from American universities. So one part canceled our 20 year long partnership and our other partner has cut back our programs for my students going there and for the students coming to my university, which is a real shame. I'm not really sure. I actually wanted to ask you, Edelson, is it a money issue or is it like Simon is talking about like an imbalance of um, sending students um, outbound and inbound perhaps? If you could write in the comment um, in the chat. Um, yeah, perhaps Simon or Peter could take this up. Okay. Less interest on the American side in international programs. Okay. So perhaps they're focusing more on their domestic programs as opposed to providing staff and um, faculty support to run these international programs. Simon and Peter, do you want to add anything to that from your experience, perhaps of um, the other end, not wanting to continue a partnership? Uh, well, uh, allow me to take the floor first. I, I, what I'm trying to say is if we can uh, minimize the non-academic factors, uh, to the, I would say, to let both parties know that what we're trying to build up the academic interest is that we want to expand of the pie by improving our professional academic qualities rather than uh, be worrying about how many students in terms of how much uh, tuition fee we will gain <laughs> from other universities. Uh, those non-academic interests also include that like, probably some of the, uh, I would say, uh, based on my experience, they will base their prestige as something that we are not trying to improve the quality of the academic, uh, I would say, engagement, but we're trying to say that our name, academic prestige, can help you students boost their reputations 
In other words, we are not trying to say to build up the relation between two academic institutions. We are talking about two probably business, business companies to expand, okay? Basically to me, there is a difference between the price of a business and the quality of an academic engagement. So what I'm trying to say is maybe we should clarify this here. Uh, there's always something I would say paradox in negotiation. Are we claiming values or are we creating values? But sometimes for academic institutions, we are sometimes claiming values and creating values at the same time, but the value must be academic. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Simon? Thank yeah. you, Peter. Simon, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I think it, it's spot on what Peter's saying there. I mean, in, in our case, I think a bit different maybe to uh, Edo-san and some of the others where we're not doing exchanges, we're doing a, a one-way uh, study abroad program. So we're, we're the, in a way, the customers and they're, they're providing the business to keep with the kind of the business side. And the Americans I've found have been brilliant, to be honest. Um, very, very accepting, um, very easy to negotiate with Americans and make improvements. I'm British, uh, the British are a lot harder, a lot <laughs> harder, a lot harder. I think the British have a lot more, they're, they're more focused on that academic side and they want to keep their what, what they're doing a lot more in some ways, but the Americans are much more open to, to help the consumers. Our big problem at the moment actually is Australia. Um, that I think the Australians are really struggling due to the loss of Chinese students. And I think it's happening all over Australia now. Lots of their language centers are, are restructuring, retrenching, whatever you want to call it. And people are losing their jobs. And we're having to renegotiate with um, one of our Australian partner universities now. That's a real, a real shame, a real shame. Okay. so. Are there any other comments or questions that people would like to drop in the chat or ask directly using their mics? Okay, so are there any specific questions that people would like to ask perhaps Simon or Peter directly? We've got a maybe one or two minutes remaining before we have some announcements. Okay, well, it seems like um, there aren't any additional comments or questions. So thank you again so much to um, both Dr. Humphreys and Dr. Chen for your time today. Thank you. Informative presentation. We really appreciate you coming and presenting on behalf of the Study Abroad SIG Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just a couple of comments now from the Study Abroad SIG. Um, so we have updated our Study Abroad SIG website and um, Simon has generously offered to provide the recordings from the forum today on um, our website. So we'll um, update that on our website um, in the coming day. Actually, I didn't record because um, Chris has recorded it, I think, instead. Oh, okay. Sorry right. about that. Um, we, um, as many of you may know, we have a Study Abroad SIG publication and we're always welcoming. Oh, okay. Um, articles, anything to do with study abroad uh, research. So if you're looking to publish somewhere, um, we have peer reviewers and a great um, publications chair uh, running the publications. We have two annually. So if you'd be interested in that, please um, write to the SIG and we would be happy to help you publish. Uh, lastly, we have an opening. Uh, we, we have an opening of a publicity chair. So if you'd like to be more involved with Gerald or like to learn more about the study abroad SIG, please let us know. Um, so um, yeah, on behalf of the SIG, that's it for us. So thank you again for joining us at the study abroad SIG forum. And please let me extend um, our gratitude to Chris for facilitating this session tonight. And Sam and Hosea, who stepped in to help out with technical uh, issues. We really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. If you would like to, go ahead and unmute your mics. And let's give Simon and Peter a round of applause through our microphones. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Lind Lindell, about the uh, 